fresh meat. Blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. Halloween, as you've seen in this series, is a franchise that has been a little all over the map. Classic genre-defining entries, random sequels, sequels that have nothing to do with the main franchise, and of course, a remake and a sequel to that remake. It's had elements added and taken away that turn it into something completely different than the original concept of the babysitter murders would have ever dreamed. However, unlike some of its slasher contemporaries, Halloween never went to space or 3D although it nearly did. After the success of his first film and mostly failure of its sequel, Zombie was done with the franchise. They had been the most strenuous, difficult, professional times in his life, and he had pretty much said all he wanted to say through the first two movies. Malika Kad, current head of the group that owned the rights to the Halloween franchise and Miramax Dimension, the production company that had released the most recent entries, were ready to keep the current timeline going, with or without Zombie. And after the success of their own 3D remake, My Bloody Valentine 3D, Todd Farmer and Patrick Lucier were commissioned to script the film and turn in a draft in only eight days. As production began, however, the studio shut everything down after feeling the entire thing was being rushed. Or because the company ran out of money, whichever you choose to believe. This is as far as Halloween 3D would go. Starting in 2009, the film would be teased and talked about with release dates of 2012 and 2014 being discussed until it eventually just disappeared. The movie begins at the end of Halloween 2 with Laurie killing Michael only to discover Loomis under the mask. It's here the film does something that no other Halloween film has done. It turns into a sort of road movie with Michael and Laurie wanting to be near each other and being protective of one another. Sheriff Brackett is the only other returning character, but we are introduced to a handful of new ones. At various points, Tom Atkins was attached to appear as a doctor, a great wink to the original Halloween 3 with Tyler Maine set to come back for a third film as Michael and Scout Tyler Compton signing on as Lori. While I won't go through the whole movie here, the script can be found online and it is worth a look. It's filled with naming connections to John Carpenter like McCready Dam and Pliskin Park and has some genuinely fun ideas and set pieces that could have worked on screen. After the craze of 3D died down, the film was even positioned Positioned to be part of the found footage craze, but everyone involved agreed that the project had gotten too far away from the heart of the original idea. After too much time in development hell, 3D was dead, and a new project titled Halloween Returns was announced in 2015. This film would look to not be a remake, but a genuine sequel to the original 2, wiping away everything after 1981's Halloween 2. It would be scripted by Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan, with the directing duties falling to Dunstan. The pair had written the Feast trilogy and a few of the Saw sequels, while also being the creative minds behind The Collector and The Collection. Their film would take place in 1988 with Myers serving time in prison on death row for the murders from the original film, although the murder count would include those at the hospital it is never mentioned as happening. Power outage during his execution would lead to his escape and eventual new killing spree in the town of Russellville, Illinois, and a confrontation with a child of one of the original victims and his teenage friends. Again littered with nods to past films that this new iteration tried to erase, something we would see in the films that actually got made, this screenplay even boasts post credit scene reintroducing Dr. Sam Lewis, a character conspicuously absent from the film proper. In December 2015, the Akkad family would announce that Halloween Returns was cancelled and because Dimension Films had failed to get out a film as scheduled, they had lost the rights to the entire film franchise. There were a few other horror production companies that had made an impact on the 2000s that would have probably done fine with the franchise. Platinum Dunes had already handled remakes of other slasher franchises, while Ghost House Pictures helped bring to life new incarnations of Evil Dead and Poltergeist. Blumhouse Productions ultimately went out to make the film with Miramax, to be released by Universal. Blumhouse was no slouch either. Founded in Los Angeles by Jason Blum in the year 2000, Blumhouse has a mix of big budget franchises as well as taking a chance on smaller, more independent projects. With rights in hand, Blumhouse chose a rather untraditional pair, David Gordon Green and Danny McBride. 
Yeah, that Danny McBride. You know, I see the look on your faces. You're thinking, hey, Kenny, you're from America. You probably have a printer. You could have just gone on the internet and printed that bitch. While not known for horror by any means, this writing, acting, directing duo was comfortable with each other and were huge fans of horror with a particular love for Carpenter's slasher defining original. McBride and Gordon Green had worked together in projects like Pineapple Express, Your Highness, Vice Principals, and Righteous Gemstones. While that might not look like the ingredients for a Halloween movie, we got something the franchise needed. Pieces began to fall into place as longtime collaborators came on to work on the film. John Carpenter, who hadn't been involved in the franchise since Halloween 3, came back to be an executive producer and consultant, claiming, and I quote, well, if I'm just flapping my gums here, why don't I try and make it as good as I can? So, you know, stop throwing rocks from the sidelines and get in there and do something positive. Hearing this from Carpenter, an admittedly jaded person about most of his past properties, was a shot in the arm for all involved. We also got Laurie Strode to return. Jamie Lee Curtis had come back before. Halloween, H2O, and Resurrection each would have been swan songs for the character, but neither proved to be as fulfilling. This film's main conceit is that only the first film happened and we get to see the very real emotional scars from the character and that appealed to Curtis enough to come back, even work closely with Gordon Green on the feel of a now grandmother strode. Simply titled, Halloween. The movie opens with two investigative journalists who are wrapping up the investigation of the Haddonfield murders for their podcast. We see that Michael Myers has been incarcerated in a high security mental hospital since that fateful night and the pair have brought his mask to try to get some sort of reaction out of him even though Loomis's replacement and former student Dr. Sartain says he has said nothing since he came here. The credits open with a new but familiar song. All the songs have shades of Carpenter's other films because, well, he did the entire score for this one. With no luck from Myers, Dana and Aaron go to the other main piece of the puzzle from 40 years ago. Lori has had trouble dealing with that horrible night and has become a survivalist, ever preparing for the night Michael either dies in prison or comes for her so she can handle it herself. We learn she tried to have a normal life, even having a daughter, but that daughter was taken when she was only 12 due to issues of Lori's ability to give her a normal life. She gives them little new information before kicking them out acknowledging that Myers is to be transferred out that night. We're then introduced to Lori's daughter, Karen, son-in-law, Ray, and granddaughter, Allison, who live a pretty standard suburban life, with Allison worrying more about school and boys than whatever happened in the past with her grandmother. We get a fun scene with Allison and her friends that poke fun a lot at the original sequels and any of the familial relations that the previous films tried to hammer home between Michael and Lori. Carpenter always felt it made the shape less scary, and Green and McBride certainly agreed. As the kids are prepping for a Halloween party, Lori is seemingly prepping for war as she cleans and loads guns and attempts to make herself mentally prepared. Dan and Aaron head back to their hotel to gather notes while we get to hear old recordings of Dr. Loomis discussing what Michael is. Donald Pleasance had passed decades prior, but the guy doing his voice is close enough to feel like it could have been cut content from the original. My suggestion is termination. Death. Lori meets with Allison, Karen, Ray, and Allison's boyfriend for dinner, and you feel the emotional detachment as Karen and Ray don't want her there, and Lori is unable to hold it together, with Myers being transferred in mere hours. All the actors do a great job, but this is Jamie Lee Curtis's movie. She was so young and inexperienced when she became the scream queen with the first film, but is now able to give a much more nuanced and mature performance while also pulling off a badass when need be. She has spent 40 years alternating between prepping yourself for a confrontation that may or may never happen and attempting to have what you perceive to be a normal life. To the surprise of no one, Michael breaks out of the prison transport and begins again what he started all those years before. He gets another jumpsuit from another mechanic and kills the podcasting duo before getting his original mask back. The references and callbacks fly fast and furious throughout the whole film. From Michael appearing blurred in the background to seeing the masks from Halloween 3 out on the street to certain dialogue taken directly from other films, the writers spent a lot of time sending winks and nods to longtime followers of the franchise. For many, though, it can be downright distracting from the story overall. 
Michael goes on his spree through the town, including a brutal streak that has several long takes that drive home how sadistic and random his killings are. One of the deputies from the first film here, played by Will Patton, agrees with Lori that evil should be put down. But when he and Dr. Sartain find him, the good doctor proves to be a hindrance and helps Michael kill the officer, his obsession with Myers driving him insane. Allison's friends are killed off and we get a showdown of the three generations of Strode women versus Michael and Laurie's war bunker of a house. After a tense game of cat and mouse, the final confrontation ends and it all being an elaborate trap for Michael as the three remaining protagonists lock him in a fiery jail and escape showing the emotional damage done to all three Strode women in one final callback post credits of Michael still breathing in the background just as he did 40 years prior. The movie was a smash success, making $255 million on a budget of roughly $15 million and garnered mostly positive reviews from both critics and audiences alike, certainly higher on both counts compared to the films of the previous 30 years. In July of 2019, it was announced that Halloween would receive not one, but two sequels with Halloween Kills set to release on October 16th, 2020, and Halloween Ends set to premiere a year later on October 15th, 2021. Of course, the global pandemic had other ideas and the films were shifted to 2021 and 2022, respectively. In June of 2021, we got our look at the first full-length trailer for Halloween Kills, showing the film taking place immediately after the events of the previous film, similarly to the way Halloween 2 played out after the events of the original. Casting brings back the survivors of the original while adding Anthony Michael Hall as Tommy Doyle and Kyle Richards, Nancy Stevens, and Charles Cyphers back as their characters from the very first film. The movie premiered at the 78th Venice Film Festival on September 8th and garnered mixed reviews from those who had seen it with early screenings with McBride and Green at the helm for all three. Hopefully we have a fun and cohesive trilogy of films that finally does justice to a character that has been put through the ringer for the last 40 years. Thank you for watching our show, and if you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content to turn on the notification bell and receive notifications for all our latest videos. We're an independent company, and we appreciate all your support.